I have a quote from Goodwill, and I'm so glad y'all came. Thank you. Before I introduce Lynn, just a few housekeeping rules, items. Please turn your cell phones off. That interferes with Lynn's camera equipment and whatnot, so if you will turn those off for me, I would appreciate it. Should we need to evacuate the building? Of course, we have the front door. The very back is a, a door there. There's a door right here to the left of this door and down the hall. Restrooms through this door, down the hall, men's at the end of the hall, ladies in the little short hall. I have some brochures that have we got for free. We have some maps. We have a blue driving trail for the parkway. And we have these travel guides. They just came, so if you want one, please let me know. And we'll get you some of those. You should have a ticket. We're going to do a couple of draw ones after, so hang on to those. If you see Dr. Stone, Jeff Church, any school board member, anybody from Caldwell County Schools Maintenance, please hug their neck and thank them. They have spent many days over here. They were here all day yesterday fixing our air conditioner. Uh, we had a little issue upstairs. They spent the day, got it fixed. So if you see them, please tell them thank you for their support of this museum. So if we had to go out and hire contractors for that, we would be up the creek. So, Lynn Hawkins is the presenter today. He grew up in Brandon. Um, his mother was a teacher at Kings Creek School. I had her, I think it was fifth grade. Um, she, her sisters are Sadie Hunt Boyhill and Alice Hunt Hale. We taught uh, either Sunday school or training union at Kings Creek for mm -hmm. a while. Uh, he's married to Loretta. His daughter Courtney will be running his slideshow and she's her teacher. Mm -hmm. Yeah, has two granddaughters. He has retired from the ministry, grew up in Grandin, so he is the expert on the Grandin community. So please welcome Lynn, and if you have any questions after, he will entertain those. Thank Lynn, you. Thank you. Well, thank you so much. It's good to be here, and this is the second time I've come through. Uh, the first time, um, Matt Bumgarner talked about the railroad, and uh, I talked a little bit about Grandin. Uh, and so Jeff Stepp, about two weeks before he died, asked me to come and talk about uh, Grandin, and I said, but yeah, I, I wanted to uh, try to fix a little bit what I had missed before. But it, it's just great to be here, and I thank the museum for asking me to be here, and Cindy has been very cooperative. Uh, she and I have known each other a long time because we went to church together at King Street Baptist. Uh, but, and there are two other people here in particular. Uh, uh, Ray Triplett and I went to, tr I went to school at King's Creek together. And uh, I remember the uh, baseball team that we had, I think in 1958 or 59, uh, Ray was catcher. And he did a great job, and he's continued to do a great job. Uh, he's worked with Wes Caldwell in the Boosters Club, and uh, he told me that he'd been a scorekeeper for Wes Caldwell. So he's been extremely active in his community, which is not surprising, because he, that's just who Ray is. And then Judge Bill and I have known each other for 49 years. Now. I can be specific about that because we were counselors at Camp Patterson, at Patterson School, in 1968. And for six weeks, we went through shock therapy with all those hyper kids. <laughs> and and uh, so it, we got experience with that. Uh, my daughter Courtney is a middle school teacher at Arndt Middle School in Hickory. And that's right beside St. Stephen's High School. And, and I, when she offered to come and uh, run the uh, PowerPoint, uh, I said, yes, please do. So she's gracious enough to do that today. His granddaughter's a teacher there too. We can't escape it. Teacher, teacher, teacher. Yeah, her, her daughter, Davis, uh, teaches uh, theater, uh, at uh, Arnton Middle School, and I, I said, you know, I don't understand why 
some schools have uh, theater for kids and others don't, but that's just the way that operates, you know. But Davis uh, has done that for what, three years? Mm -hmm. Three years, okay. Okay, are we ready to get going? Okay, Grandin, an attempt at a modern town in 1912. And I need to tell you up front, in 1912, uh, Grandin and Caldwell County, generally, was still a wilderness. Uh, there just weren't that many people who lived around. There were people everywhere, but there you know, wasn't concentrated like it is today. And uh, so this was carving out a new place in Caldwell County. So when we're talking about Grandin, remember, you know, this is something brand new that has got started. And, uh, and so it's an attempt to build a modern town, and now we'll talk more about what modern means in 1912. Uh, another thing is, we don't think about, because we don't have the, the prejudice uh, of north and south like we used to. But when those Yankees from Pennsylvania started coming down here and building a town, there were people who said, we won't have anything to do with you. You Yankees would just come down here to buy up and take away our land, and, and we just resent it. And so what that meant in, it was that whenever Mr. Grandin or his representatives went out to buy up land for the railroad, there were people that said, absolutely not. And so they had to adjust their railroad to go a different way. But it, it's just interesting how things in a hundred years have changed so much. And I can imagine if uh, Mr. Grandin were alive today and my grandpa Hunt, they would be amazed how things have uh, turned out. Okay, uh, we're in the beginning. Grandin. Yes. Anytime. And as a matter of fact, anybody who wants to add to or ask questions or tell something, just go ahead. This is just an informal get together, so we'll just enjoy one another. And, uh, and she's right. Um, this was a big undertaking. Mr. Grandin, as she indicated, was independently wealthy uh, because of the uh, logging outfits that he had up in Pennsylvania. And, and they even went out to Missouri uh, at one time and had uh, logging out there. But anyway, uh, here's the beginning. And you can see how the little town started. Uh, the first building to be built was the boarding house. And it was built in 1912. And that's the uh, house that I grew up in. Uh, there were 18 rooms in the house, and by the time that I came along, and uh, all the rooms were just filled with junk. So, so it doesn't matter how what size your house is. Yeah, please. Yeah, there's uh, my mother, 
Doris Hunt Hawkins. <clears throat> In that picture, she's 85 years old. Uh, she uh, was the youngest of uh, three daughters that uh, Hartley and Nellie Hunt had. And uh, by the way, uh, I, my intention today, and I got this idea from Cindy when we were talking previously, uh, talk about people uh, and, you know, gossip a little bit today because uh, that's always interesting. Uh, she, uh, my mother was born in 1908, and she died in, uh, in 98, and uh, she was the youngest of three, and uh, she married Jess Hawkins, and that's how I got my name. Go to the next one, Gordon. Well, anyway, uh, she was a school teacher for 28 years here in Caldwell County, and uh, she uh, spent most of her life uh, teaching either in uh, public school or in uh, the church where she was. She was a school teacher for many years. And this is the school that she went to. It was connected uh, with Grandin, but it served uh, a wide area. Uh, I learned when I was down in Alexander County that local schools like this popped up uh, quite often because people uh, kids in particular either walked or maybe rode a horse to school so they had to be a school rather you know accessible to them so this uh, this school building was uh, about a hundred yards uh, past uh, the, the Grandin community and it served uh, Zach's Fork, uh, the Yankin River Road 268 and even down the Tom Dooley Road. So uh, it reached out. By the time uh, Mama went to school there, there was a porch. Uh, you can see the doorway. There was a porch there and it was covered. And so she said that uh, that made it easier, you know, when you were wet, you know, to get the water off of you a little bit. And when you went into the, the school building itself, there was a foyer. And you put uh, your clothes, and if you had boots on, you left your, them out there, and your lunch box. And everybody in those days had to bring their own water. Uh, there was a spring about uh, 150 yards away, but you know how that works. You send two boys, or you send the boy off to get water, you never know if he's gonna show up again. <laughs> so that, that's uh, one of those things. But this picture comes from 1905, and Mama didn't start school until about 1913 or 14. And while I'm on this, uh, she went to school there uh, up until about, let's see, she was, yeah, about uh, 20, 1923 or four. And uh, the thing about that was, I lost my train of thought. She, uh, the, it went through the seventh grade. That's as far as it went. They met four or five months a year for school. So when she got through to the seventh grade, she intended to come uh, to school here at Davenport. And her father and the teacher, uh, who was Frank Smith, agreed that uh, Mama ought to take the seventh grade again. So to give her a little more knowledge and also uh, to get a little bit older because she was rather young to, to leave home and, and come to the, to the school here. So I, that's just the way things work back in those early days of the, of the 20th century. Uh, things didn't get sort of normalized, so to speak, here in Caldwell County until about 1926 when uh, the county built schools at uh, Kings Creek in Collegeville and at Happy Valley. And of course, here in Lenore, there was always a school, but um, the city schools were separate from the county schools. Okay, and uh, this picture is about uh, Mama. She gave a recital, a voice recital, in 1929 when she graduated from Davenport, and uh, she was going to go to school um, in Kentucky. I forgot what's the name of it. Asbury. Thank you. Okay, Sadie Hunt Broadhill was the 
oldest of the three sisters. And uh, she was born in 1899 and lived to 1997. Uh, she uh, was 97 years old when she died. And she had, was a pillar of our community. Uh, the most outstanding thing about her was she was very generous. Uh, she fit in well with the business that uh, her husband, J. E. Brawhill, started up. Uh, I think, you know, we don't think about this, but <clears throat> a spouse <clears throat> who, whose uh, husband or wife is active in politics or important within the community, that puts a lot of pressure on the other spouse. But uh, Aunt Sadie just had the ability to be adaptive and, and she contributed very much to uh, the company and whatever needed to be done. And while I'm thinking of it, if, if James Brawhill or Jim Brawhill can live to August 17th, he will turn 90 years old. And that means that Aileen, Paul, and Jim, uh, three in one family, are in their 90s. And so we're going to have a parade, I'm sure. <laughs> uh, Aileen, would you like to say something about your mother? Oh, I do. <laughs> Wonderful, isn't it? Being and a service to the community, visits the people, takes flowers, does she wears me out. Just, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, just keep going. Uh, go, to, go to the next one, if you will. Okay. Alice Hunt Howe was the other sister. Uh, she had a, 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 her own history. She was a school teacher herself. And uh, she ended up in Jackson County teaching school in a one-room schoolhouse. Uh, now, what is in Jackson County that is famous? Cherokee? Cherokee. And uh, so while she was up there, she met a man and she married him. And his name was Grover Cleveland Wiggins. And uh, when they married, he was ambitious enough, you know, to get away from Jackson County where there wasn't a lot going on. And he went up north to Michigan and he worked in one of the automobile plants up there. But he didn't work there long because he caught a fever and he died from it. And so Aunt Alice had to go up and, and fetch his body and come back to Jackson County. Well, uh, a little over a year later, she married again, uh, Bill Howe. And uh, they came back to, to Caldwell County, and uh, Aunt Alice worked uh, with her father, uh, Hartley Hunt. He, she was a secretary, treasurer, whatever needed to be done. And uh, then eventually she graduated from that to teaching at Kings Creek School. She taught the fifth grade for years, and uh, her that was her crowning touch right there. Uh, I have met a lot of women who had her for a teacher and they have all said that they appreciated uh, Alice Howe so much 
because she taught them how to be a lady. You, a, a woman sits in a certain way, keeps your knees together. Uh, you, uh, you know, you dress in a certain way. Uh, yes, and, and Cindy can vouch for that. Well, well, you know, a lot of girls just don't get that at home. And uh, so they need to know that. Uh, and they, and they appreciate knowing that. So anyway, that was one of the things that she would, uh, that was the thing that uh, impressed uh, most girls. And I assumed that uh, she kept the boys occasionally and told them, you always open a door for a lady. Say please and thank you. Do those things that uh, show that you have some character about you. And you know, uh, I have to admit, uh, our kids today just don't have that. Um, very few will open a door. They do for me because they don't want to see me fall through the door and they open it up so I walk in. But uh, usually uh, uh, a teenager will open a door to go in first and, and uh, if a, a lady or a gentleman's there, they just let them uh, operate on their own. Okay. Here's a picture of uh, the three girls in front of their house in Grandin. Uh, Aunt Sadie is the taller one, Aunt Alice, and that, at that time, uh, my mother was just a little girl. And uh, they lived in a four-room house, but that was okay, they got along just fine. And that was in the summer of 1950. Hartley Hunt, now, he, uh, is the one that that I knew. I, I got to know him a little bit. Uh, I was three years old when he died, but what I remember about him in particular, he liked to get a hold of me and then put it, put me between his knees and then say, try to get away. <laughs> and I couldn't do it. <laughs> he, he had me there and he captured me. But the, the important thing about him is, uh, Mr. Brandon trusted him. Uh, Grandpa Hunt was an experienced forester before he came to North Carolina. As a matter of fact, in 1906, uh, Brandon sent him down here to investigate what the uh, forest land looked like. And uh, a little bit later, there'll be a picture of uh, Grandpa Hunt standing in front of the oak tree. And there are several pictures of him standing beside or in front of uh, large trees. Uh, and that's where, uh, that's what he thought of when he uh, was out in the forest. What are these big trees? We can cut those down and make them into uh, boards, whatever we need to do. Okay. Grandmother Nellie Hunt Stone, Nellie Stone Hunt. Uh, she was the mother of the three girls, and she came down, and she was not happy uh, living in Grandin. Remember I said that Caldwell County at that particular time was a, a wilderness. She came down from a more populated area, and that's what she was used to. And she just got homesick, and she went back and didn't come back to Grandin. And that's one of those unfortunate things. She was a gracious lady herself. But uh, she was just out of her uh, water line. Okay. This is a picture of them as a family in 1913. And uh, you can see that uh, Aunt Sadie had grown up into a young woman. And uh, Aunt Alice was not far behind. And Mama was still just a little girl. The Greer sister. This is great. No. Nope. Very few people remember the Greer sisters, but they were uh, three old maids that lived together. It was their land that Mr. Grandin bought, that, and he was going to build the town of Grandin on part of that land that he bought from them. He gave them uh, a lease for life uh, so that they could live there as long as they lived, and, and it was rent free. When Mr. Grandin came down himself, he boarded with the Greer sisters. 
and uh, he appreciated them so much that he put a bathroom in their house. Actually, he put two bathrooms. And in 1913, 14, almost everybody in Caldwell County had an outhouse. That's just the way that was. So having an indoor uh, commode uh, was wonderful. You didn't have to get, fight the, the cold when you went out sometimes. But in any event, uh, he did that for them, and he also added on a kitchen. And uh, they got along well with each other, and the, the Greer sisters not only uh, had him for uh, a border, but there were other people that came and went, and they could stay down there until the boarding house was finished. And so the Greer sisters paid, played an integral part. Now, that's something else that we just take for granted. If, uh, for instance, uh, I fell down and uh, got hurt, you know, you just call the rescue squad. Come up here and get this guy out of the way. And they'd come. Uh, Miss Ida, the one in black, in 1916, fell and broke her hip. There was not a doctor or a hospital in Caldwell County that could do anything for her. They had to put her in a wagon and take her to Statesville. And when I think of that, the excruciating pain that she must have experienced. But she made it, and they set her uh, hip, and uh, there she is, 1962, going strong. She died when she was 92, and Miss Cora was the middle one. She was 87 when she died, and uh, Miss Clara was 83. She was a school teacher, and uh, she taught there at Mount Bethel and at Kings Creek as well. Uh, they were strong Baptists, big time Baptists, and Democrats. Uh, so that, that's just who they were. Okay. This is the house that they uh, they lived in, and the uh, upstairs part is where uh, the boarders would stay, Mr. Grandin and whoever else came through. So uh, that house faced south, and this is the back side of it. Mr. Grandin, independently wealthy, uh, as Aline has mentioned, uh, he had success, his family, and he had success logging up north, and so he came south, as she indicated, uh, to find more resources for timber. And so uh, when he came, he, uh, he stayed with the, the Greer sisters, and he started up the building process. Of course, he had representatives uh, besides uh, Grandpa Hunt to help him, because he, he spent a lot of time up in uh, Pennsylvania where he came from. Uh, but he, he had trusted people, and for the most part, uh, that part went well. What happened, there, the business part failed. And although he had built quite a bit, had the, the big barn built, I call it barn because that's what I think of, uh, the big band mill, uh, it didn't operate but very little. Uh, because money got tight, and then World War I got started. And that always takes a lot of money away from individuals one way or the other. Okay. Mrs. Grandin, uh, you can see she looks like she would be a determined woman. But she's also a very pretty woman, too. Uh, the interesting thing about her she was born in 1872 and died in 1960. Uh, Mr. Grandin was born in 1871 and died in 1920. He died on the last day of 1920. He, uh, he and his family were in a car accident, and uh, Mrs. Grandin was the worst for it at first, but she recovered. Their son also recovered. But Mr. Brandon uh, did not, and he died from what they called internal in injuries. Uh, they had no way of you know, investigating inside like they do nowadays, and, and so he died. The curious thing about Miss Grandin is, 
She never told her children or her grandchildren about Grandin in North Carolina. Uh, her granddaughter, Betsy Wilcott, in 1994, contacted my mother and said, I've heard about Grandin, I want to know more. She just happened to be going to uh, Florida and she stopped by the house and Mama pulled out her albums and started showing her all this and she said, I'm amazed. Not a word has ever been said about how this was going to be a big town. So that, it's interesting, I guess because uh, Mrs. Grandin was so disappointed that the business failed here in North Carolina and then her husband died. Uh, I guess I would be cautious to say too much too. Okay. This is, yeah, thank you. This is uh, the Wilcox over here on the right and Mama and my brother Benny were taken right there. That's what the uh, boarding house looked like in 1912 and afterwards until 1955. Uh, people stayed in it. Uh, there, like I said, there was a commode in every building, at least one. And, and that, so people could stay there and they didn't have to go worry about going outside. But uh, if you will go to the next one, there's another view of the boarding house. It had that long porch on it. Uh, this is where fresh water was kept. Uh, it was fed by one branch, and this is an earthen dam, as they call it. Uh, it held the drinking water and water you used to wash with. Uh, and it had a concrete bottom and once a year uh, it was emptied out and they were, somebody would go in there, they get up all the sludge that was there on the bottom, tried to keep it, you know, as sanitary. And still yet, if, it, if Asha had been around back in those days, they would have had a double duck fit. <laughs> uh, but you know, people got along just fine. Uh, Nobody ever complained about the water. Uh, this is a picture of my mother and dad. My dad uh, grew up in Buffalo. He taught 32 years at Patterson School for Boys. This is the house uh, that we saw, the boarding house, after it was renovated. Uh, my dad did a lot of work on it, and of course he had to have a lot of help doing that. Uh, and those are shingles uh, that are put up on the side, asbestos shingles, because back in the 50s, uh, asbestos shingles was a thing. <laughs> so that's what it is. This is the beginning of building the town. Uh, it's taken from the north facing south. There were going to be 32 houses for the workers. Each house had a commode in it, so you don't see any outhouses. That, that just wasn't an option. And in 1912, that was something big. Uh, we don't think about it because we're so used to having our own bathroom. But back in those days, uh, like I said, everybody had their outhouse, but Mr. Grandin said, no, no we're not gonna do that. So, uh, this is this part of the 32 houses that were built. This is uh, Main Street of Grandin, and you can see there the uh, boarding house. The house right above it is where uh, Grandpa Hunt lived, and then uh, the other houses were where workers could live. And <clears throat> that uh, that is not an outhouse; that's a fire hydrant house. And, and in it, you open the door. And there was a fire hydrant right in the middle. And then there was this spool of hose. And so there must have been, I don't know how much was on it. It looked like 100 feet, but I, I don't know that that was true. But in any event, uh, that was what was in that uh, little hydrant house. And there were three of them. There was one here next to the store. Uh, there was one down at the, at the big... Uh, 
band mill and also one over at the planing mill. This is uh, a manhole. For 105 years old, it looks good, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. uh, they knew what they were doing when they, they mixed that concrete uh, because it's still there behind uh, the boarding house. Uh, I took that picture not uh, but maybe three weeks ago and it's still in good shape. It was simple. They, they had eight inch terracotta pipe that they linked together and uh, it's still in good shape. The planing mill was a place where finished uh, boards would go to be shaped in, in size uh, or you know design and along the side on both sides along this side there were doors that could be pushed back and forth and so that they could be loaded on uh, to wagons whatever wood was there unloaded onto and then when it was finished sent off this is a double band mill now you know uh, I'm always fascinated when I when I hear that there's going to be a talk about the Great Pyramid of Egypt, you know, Pyramid of Giza, and how 4,600 years ago they could build something that precise, and it's lasted for 4,600 years. That's the Pyramid of Giza. Well, this is comparable. Look at how much work was done there. Uh, they had to cut the, the timber, and then they they put it together and I'm thinking you know for 1912 they did a remarkable job uh, and and up until maybe 10 years ago this uh, the main part of this building was still standing so uh, I'm just amazed this is what it looked like when uh, Courtney and I uh, were around that barn we called it a barn because that's where my dad kept cattle, he kept a herd of about 30, and uh, they would go inside and they would stay there, and we would feed them. Uh, he also put up a basketball goal on the second floor so I could play basketball. And I did that in the wintertime because in the summertime it was insufferably hot on the second floor. Uh, down on the bottom floor, uh, much cooler but uh, it was also much darker too. This is the drying platform. The, the boards would be cut to shape or to size and then they would be taken out here and left for a while to cure and then they would be sh shipped on over to the planing mill. Now there's that picture I was talking about uh, Grandpa Hunt standing in front of that white oak tree. Uh, any big tree like that, he, he was just fascinated by it. So he's had two or three pictures that I have of his standing beside a big tree. When it came, when the uh, business failed, they sold off the land. Uh, Grandpa Hunt was a forester and also a surveyor. And whenever disputes came up about where the lines were, he was called upon to go and check it out. And uh, his favorite horse was Buck. And he rode that uh, horse all over Caldwell, Wilkes, Watauga, Avery County. Uh, and then we complained about how long it takes to get from here to Boone in our cars. By the way, uh, Allie, didn't uh, Aunt Sadie ride a horse to Boone? When Mother reached uh, the same stage she was talking about, Doris, after seventh grade, my grandfather realized that he was going to have to find a place for his girls to continue education. And for my mother, that was to go to Boone to a little, a small school that had just been started about 10 years ago now Appalachian State University. At that time, it was a high school, and it went through grade seven through 11. 
And when the students finished this high school, they could get a teaching certificate to teach in one of those one-room schoolhouses. And he showed you the pictures of it. So, uh, grand our, our grandfather enrolled mother in this uh, small school in Boone. But in order to get from Brandon to Boone, you had to go through this wilderness that Lynn's telling you about. You had to go up through Darby and Buffalo Cove and, and who knows what all, and come out somehow in Boone up there. And so Mother had to ride a horse, too, to get there. They had set on her trunks and so forth. But, so it was just Mother on her horse who was mauled, and we have pictures of her on that one, and uh, my grandfather on Buck. And it took them the better part of three days to get from Brandon uh, to Boone. And Mother said that, uh, of course, there were no uh, towns, no motels, no place to stay. But Grandfather had made this trip so many times, he knew people along the way. And when they come to my time, uh, he would stop and the people, friendly people, would take me in and give them a good hot meal and, and a place to spend the night and then they continued on. So when Mother was about 95, by my age, <laughs> One day she was blind, and but uh, she had a wonderful driver, and they were driving back up to Boone for some sort of an event, maybe a reunion, and she was having trouble, so she with her sciatica, so she was sitting on what they call an egg crate, one of those plastic things that look like an egg crate, and she said. Um, to her driver, she said, Buddy, the first time I ever came to Boone, I was riding on horseback, and this time I'm riding on an egg crate. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, when Grandpa Hunt would go out, uh, he would stay at people's houses because he was gone from Monday through Saturday. And uh, at one of these homes, uh, and he's bound to have had many more anecdotes than he ever told uh, around my mother anyway. But he said, w one house, he said he went to stay one night, and uh, while he was there, uh, the pig, a pig, got into the house and went over, and they bought uh, sacks of flour. And uh, he tore, the pig tore into that flour bag and was eaten from it. Well, the lady of the house came in and shoot him off, and, uh, then time passed, and it was time for supper. So the, the lady of the house went in to that very sack and got flour out of it and made biscuits. <laughs> but you know, like I said, Asha would go crazy if that time like that. But uh, I'm sure that he had more anecdotes than he ever told the family, uh, because back in those days, uh, there were stills all over Wilkes County and probably Caldwell County too, and there. Then there have been times when somebody came out with a gun and said, what are you doing here? And uh, he, he'd just beg off and say, well, I'm, I'm, it's, on, it's my job. Okay. Uh, this is just a sample of the kind of uh, uh, machinery they had to uh, shape up boards. Uh, one is called uh, a single edger. Does anybody know exactly what that is? The other one is a side saw. Trim one edge board at a time. One at a time. Okay. One edge board at a time. Thank you. Appreciate that, Ray. But uh, this is just a sample of the, the money they put into the equipment. And the strange thing about it, when the uh, business went under, they sold uh, a lot of it. But this, uh, these ma machines, were cut into pieces and, and sold as scrap metal. Uh, I guess that's just the way business operates. This is downstairs, and that pillar 
holds up this machine and I don't know what that machine is for but uh, I put it in there just to let you see how big the machinery was that they had. The typical way of getting around Grandin and the uh, 19 teams was horse and buggy. Uh, there were cars. Uh, Con McGlamory was a person that worked at Grandin. He bought a car. Uh, and most of the time when it rained, he got stuck because, you know, you, all the, the deep ruts that were in the road. I don't have any pictures of the trestles except for this one. Uh, this pile driver is driving post in the ground to uh, hold up the trestle and uh, it's called a pile driver. I understand that there were 20 trestles between Grandin and North Wilkesboro and there was uh, one tunnel 200 feet long, but uh, I don't have any other trestle picture. There's the train. That is a, a phone, you know, you, it's recognizable. Uh, the patent on it was 1903, it is 1903. Uh, and that wire around it, there were places that they could stop and make calls and that wire went up to a pole where the, the main wire was and they could call anywhere from Darby to Kings Creek or back to North Wilkesboro and maybe even to Lenore if you got in the right place. Uh, but to let you know <clears throat> and appreciate uh, where we are today, our house phones and our cell phones, uh, this box weighs about 30 pounds, so uh, it wasn't all that light. Bib Williams was the railroad supervisor, and uh, he rode this hand car up and down the railroad to look for problems. Uh, and like anything, you know, you build it, something goes wrong, so he, he did that. This stuff was called the Dinky. It was a locomotive, and it was about half the size, half the length of the regular train. A uh, fellow named Bert Will Wilson uh, operated it, and he did for uh, a long time. Finally, uh, when the, the business went under, he went back north, and as luck would have it, he came down with uh, appendicitis. And because of the lack of medical knowledge, uh, the poison got in his system, he died from it. Now this is uh, uh, the dinky when it uh, went, was derailed and fell. Notice how close the river is to the railroad. Uh, but that, that's, uh, they had to get a train from North Wilkesboro to come and uh, put it back on track. There was religion in Grandin too. Uh, the Adventist uh, would go over to Moriah's Chapel uh, and they would share that church with the Methodist and the Baptist too would go over there. Uh, although the Baptist eventually got uh, Mr. Grandin to give them a plot of land and they could build a church there. But uh, Bob Isabel was an Adventist preacher, and he was one of those guys that everybody liked, and they invited him to preach often. But in this case, he's uh, baptizing a woman. The big store housed everything that you needed. Uh, Mama said that on the left-hand side was the post office. Uh, behind it, on back toward the back of the store, uh, horse and mule equipment, you know, bridles, uh, saddles. Uh, then on the other side, canned goods. Uh, upstairs was the doctor's office. Uh, oh, <laughs> we've come a long ways, folks. Uh, if somebody got sick, say down toward Elk Creek, 
the doctor would get on the train and go down to Elk Creek. The train would stop and stay there as long as the doctor needed to go doctor on a person. When he came back to the train, they'd take off. Uh, things have really changed. This is the tunnel right here. Uh, I don't know if you can see it, but there are two white dots back in, in the tunnel. Uh, that's a horse's head. So that tunnel is much bigger than it appears to be uh, from the picture. And this is the uh, Randon Lumber Company at work. It did uh, cut up some trees, had lumber out, drying, uh, but that didn't last very long at all. Courtney put on here railroad above stream and she has a, an arrow. You can see how close the river is to uh, the railroad track. H.C. Uh, Landon <clears throat> was a fellow who had the railroad built and he was hard headed. Uh, the old folks that lived along the river kept telling him, you can't put the railroad that close to the river because there are times when it will swell great big. And he is reported to have said, I could stop that river with the heel of my shoe. Well, in 1916, he didn't have a big enough shoe. <laughs> and uh, the, here is what happened. You can see how the railroad was just dug out. The river just rose right up. And I read somewhere where it was 14 feet above flood level. So that's a lot of water. This is another show how it, uh, the river just dug it out. And here, uh, it's hard to imagine, but this is where the railroad went across the creek and there was a trestle there. It washed the trestle away. <clears throat> and I put this in there so that we could appreciate our modern times. Can you see that uh, lawnmower? Uh, has anybody ever pushed one like that? I like these uh, riding mowers myself. <laughs> but, and there's that uh, uh, railroad phone there. And then uh, over here are uh, cultivators that you use in a garden. But I, I thought uh, we've come a long ways uh, because most of our lawn mowers uh, either self-propelled or we have a riding mower. We are so lucky. And that is our presentation. Thank you. Yes, oak trees in particular. They did uh, cut some poplar, uh, poplar, and uh, certainly white pine, but uh, they were looking for the hardwoods in particular. Yes, sir. The, man, the name of the man who laid out the railroad was Landon. H.C. Landon. Did he also lay out the, the city, the town? He did. Well, now, was the town that flood that wiped out the railroad, what did it do to the town? Nothing. The town was up on a hill. Uh, it ran up uh, to the uh, band mill, but the planing mill was above the, the water. It spread out across the field before it got up to the uh, planing mill. So the cause of the failure of the business was related to the railroad flood, is that right? I'm sorry. The, the, the railroad being washed out by the flood, that was the reason for the failure of the business? Yes. Right. When the business people moved away, when it was and that too. Yeah, they moved away because they lost their jobs. Are yes, sir. The vestiges of the railroad still there? there? No, not really. There's a cut through the mountain uh, down on the Tom Dooley Road. But that's the only thing I know. Dave? Yes, a question on the, uh, you mentioned the oak and poplar and so forth. 
These trees grow all the way up the mountains, all the way up to New York State. Was there an economic reason why they didn't cut them, say, in Pennsylvania or Virginia or West Virginia? Or why did they come all the way to Grandin? It, it seems that uh, Mr. Grandin wanted to do something on his own beyond what the family was doing. And uh, I, I, I was told by William Turnmeyer, who uh, was born in 1900 and lived up Setzer's Creek, uh, that uh, Mr. Grandin went on vacation and came to Rowan Rock. And when he saw the trees down here, he caught his imagination. And uh, so he sent people down here to investigate. He became convinced that this was a good place to work. What year was that? 1906. Yeah. Wait just a minute. Yeah. What you say the man's name was? Uh, Grover. Uh, is that his name? Is that guy I heard you say? What is it? Grover, somebody in there now. Grover. What? Grover. Oh, Grover Cleveland Wiggins. Well, he, he actually sounds like a president. <laughs> That's exactly right. His family was were Democrats, and they named him. For Grover. And after Grover Cleveland, you know, he was two times after after Benjamin Harrison, and then again. The only man to have the presidency twice. Thank you for telling us that. You're welcome. Okay. Uh, yes, is the boarding house or any of the other buildings still there in Grandin? No, uh, the buildings, uh, the uh, van mill and the planing mill, uh, got in such bad repair they collapsed. Uh, and uh, Edgar Howe owns that property. Uh, he did have insurance on both buildings, uh, but he had to use that for different reasons, and they wouldn't reinsure those buildings, and they just rotted down. I Googled this before I came here, and he said that the flood of 1916 didn't damage the town. But he said, I, I think it was somewhere around 1940, there was a much bigger flood. 1940. The 40 flood it didn't make any difference. It, the damage had been done in 1916. Like you said, it was all the railroad was destroyed. They had to put it in the Yeah, right. Uh, the railroad was responsible for bringing in uh, food, supplies, and taking lumber away. Right. Well, it sure has been my pleasure to talk with you. I'm glad that you came today, and I hope that uh, you, at least you can remember the pictures that you saw and enjoy uh, the program. Thank you again. All right, got your tickets out. I'm going to call some numbers. If you have the number I call, I've got something for you. I will do the last two numbers. The first one is 14. That's the last two numbers. Anybody got 14? Yay! Come on, That's okay. The next one is, you're welcome. The last, the next number is eight. It's the last number. Anybody have eight? Right here. Hey. Where'd it go? The next number is, th uh, it'll be 3,000. The last number is zero. Anybody have zero? The last number is last two numbers is ninety seven. Anybody have ninety seven? <laughs> <laughs> The next number will be uh, 90. 90? Anybody have 90? 
Right. How about 96? We will have another copy with the curator in August. Uh, please come back. I'll be sending out emails. If you don't get our email, please let me know. We'll put you on our mail list and I uh, think Judge Bill has something to say. We want to point out that uh, Bobby Curtis is here. Bobby, yes. Bobby's going to be doing a presentation for us in January, September. September. Yay, Miss Bobby. And You've not... be announced. It's a one, a one lady show called Nance Do. And it'll be, is that an evening performance for our coffee curator? Evening? Is it evening? Evening performance. And there'll be more information about that very soon. I have seen that. You are missing a treat if you don't come see her. She's phenomenal. She does Burdell and Fanny Crosby. You, you, you please come. We'll be sending information out about that. And like I said, if you don't get emails from us, please let me know. We'll put you on our email list. This is, this is the script. And this has to do with a criminal trial. True story. And there's a part for a judge. And guess who she drafted? You! <laughs> <laughs> there is still coffee. There's still donuts. Miss hey, Judy on. has hey, the travel on. guides over here. There are maps. And we got the Blue Ridge Parkway brochures over there. Gretchen has something to say. So... great our area is so rich and we don't know our story a lot of us so please come visit here we're open Tuesday through Friday 10 to 4 30 Saturday morning 9 to 12 we'd love to have you come and visit and y'all please come back so, thank you help yourself and we will see you in August Cindy Day is doing a wonderful job taking over as curator of our Caldwell Heritage Museum. Please come be a volunteer. Support our museum. 112 Baden Street, Lenore, North Carolina, 28645. And thanks to Lynn Hawkins for a great presentation.